Hi everyone, I am Leonard, I'm from Plymouth University and today I am here to talk to you about my final year undergraduate dissertation um, and I would like to start with thanking the Experimental Psychology Society for awarding me the undergraduate dissertation prize. I am really honored to have received it and I'm thrilled to share this project with you today. Uh, now, in this project, my supervisor Andy Wills and I were interested in some paradoxical predictions that attentional theories of learning make under concurrent load. In this particular experiment, we looked at a very puzzling phenomena called the inverse base rate effect. Now, in order to showcase the effect, I would like you to engage in a bit of a role play. Imagine that you are a doctor who is seeing patients one at a time. Now, you encounter two types of patients. One type of patient has a rash and a red eye, and you need to diagnose those symptoms as the cyan disease. Now, the other type of patient has a rash and a swollen lip, and you need to diagnose those symptoms as a raisin disease. Now, as you keep encountering more and more patients, you figure out that both diseases share a single symptom, rash, and each disease have their own unique symptom. For example, red eye is symptomatic of the cyan disease and swollen lip is symptomatic of the raisin disease. Now you also figure out that there are three times as many cases of cyan disease as raisin disease. So you can say that there is a common disease and there is a rare disease. Now imagine that you take your break and go have lunch and after you return to your shift, you continue seeing patients and one patient walks in who's exhibiting symptoms of red eye and swollen lip. Now the question is, what disease does this patient have? Now if you're a rational responder, you would say that this patient is suffering from the cyan disease. Now, this diagnosis is the most likely to be a correct diagnosis because given the information that you have and your previous experience, uh, the common disease is the most likely to occur given the available information and the symptoms that the patient is exhibiting. Now, this is not something that we observe in this experiment. In this experiment, when people are faced with the ambiguous combination of unique symptoms at the same time, they systematically prefer the rare disease. Plainly put, participants systematically prefer the low probability solution to these ambiguous scenarios. Now, here you can see a bit more of a technical description of this experiment. In this experiment, participants usually start with the training phase where they learn the relationship between compound of symptoms and their respective diseases and then uh, transition to the test phase where they need to make judgments about individual symptoms and uh, their novel combination. Now, in the table here, you see our two different types of patients that I'm going to refer to as two different trial types. So you see the common trial type on the first, one, first line, uh, the capital letters denote the different symptoms. For example, A here is the shared symptom, B is the unique symptom, and you can see that they only occur with the common disease. Whereas on the second line, you see the shared symptom again, A, and you see the unique symptom, C, that only occurs with the rare disease. And you see that uh, the common trial type occurs three times as many occasions as the rare trial type. And uh, participants usually are required to reach a certain learning criteria, so they either have to uh, reach a certain level of accuracy or they need to complete a fixed number of trials before they transition to the test phase. Now, in the test phase, they make judgments about individual symptoms and the novel combination of them. And the critical test item you, that you see on the bottom BC is the ambiguous combination of unique symptoms that participants systematically classify as symptomatic of the rare disease. Now, this is a puzzling phenomena, but now that we have defined it operationally, we can look at how certain theories might try to explain this behavior. 
Now, there are multiple theories trying to explain this systematic rare preference. One of the most notable ones is EXIT, an exemplar-based error-driven attentional learning model. Now, it is a formal computational model, but without going into the details of its architecture, it simply formalizes the way selective attention is allocated in order to reduce prediction error. So, in an inverse base rate experiment, EXIT uh, would first learn the common disease. So, first, because of the amount of exposure you get to common trial types, you reach uh, a learning asymptote for uh, the combination of, of A and B, and you learn to associate these, disease, these symptoms to the common disease, but you are still learning about the rare disease, and in order to reduce uh, the errors you make, you start to allocate your attention away from A and towards the unique rare symptom C. So as a result, uh, C acquires higher attentional salience, which means that you will be more likely to allocate your attention towards C than towards A or B. And when you see both B and C at the same time during the test phase, you allocate your attention to C, which in turn will dominate responding, resulting in this systematic rare preference. Now, EXIT describes this process unambiguously, which allows us to formulate some very specific predictions if, uh, with some auxiliary assumptions that we can make about certain manipulations, certain interference, and uh, one such case can be concurrent load. For example, other exemplar-based attentional models could accommodate the results acquired under concurrent load if they took the assumption that concurrent load disrupts the attentional system of the model. For example, uh, one such model is Alcov, and if we follow that reasoning, we can postulate that if concurrent load disrupts the attentional learning or the attentional system of exit, then during the test phase, attentional allocation uh, should increase towards the common unique symptom B um, and result in a more equated uh, responses. So, in terms of exit, uh, you can actually simulate it as well, and I did not include it here, but there are many implementations out there that you can use. Um, the, way, the, the way to do it, similar to Alcov, is to shut down the attentional learning system by setting the learning attentional learning parameter to zero, uh, which in turn actually predicts a common preference on these ambiguous combination of unique symptoms. So, in this, on these trials, EXIT actually predicts that people will pick the common disease much more often than the rare disease. And this is interesting. This is interesting because it is paradoxical. What EXIT says here is that you, under concurrent load, you will become more rational. Now, fortunately, there is an empirical side of it, uh, side for this, and previous work tried to explore the relationship between concurrent load and the systematic rare bias in the inverse base rate effect. Uh, Lamberts and Kent uh, asked participant asked participants to complete the canonical untouched version of the inverse base rate effect experiment, uh, something that we have described previously a few slides before and also asked participants to, concur to complete a concurrent load condition, where participants learned the relationship between compounds of symptoms and diseases, uh, but during the, uh, the test phase they also needed to simultaneously complete a concurrent load task while making the, uh, these diagnoses. So, Lumberts and Kent uh, employed a counting task where participants needed to count backwards in the multiples of three from a thousand. Now, interestingly, 
they reported no changes in the in participants' response preferences across conditions. Now, there can be a few reasons why it might be. First is that the concurrent load had no effect whatsoever. Alternatively, the concurrent load had an effect, but has no qualitative impact on the systematic rare preference that participants exhibit in the, uh, in the paradigm. Now, both conclusions are a bit problematic because given the frequentist statistical methods of the time, it is not possible to conclude from a null result. So that's something that we wanted to explore again and also to have a second look at the data because, as I said, exit predicts something qualitatively different than what uh, Lambert and Ken reported. And they were very kind enough to share their data. And this was before the open practices became standard. So the data was already in the lab when I started the project. And while looking at the data, what we observed and what we picked up on was that participants spent much more time in the in the diagnosis tasks while in the concurrent load condition now this means that participants had uh, additional uninterrupted thinking time that could potentially compensate for the concurrent load now in our case this additional thinking time allows or even facilitates attentional allocation to cues and there is precedence in the literature when, in a different paradigm, um, this additional thinking time ad under concurrent load was the causal factor of the qualitative change and participants responding. Uh, and people have arrived uh, at the incorrect conclusions because of such confounds. So that is something that we, uh, attempt, we try to address. And we also try to address some other aspects of the experiment. For example, uh, in, in Lambert's and Kent's, uh, Kent's experiment, participants needed to simultaneously complete both the concurrent load task and the, the diagnosis task. Now, it risks the possibility that the, the additional load interfered with the task demands, but not the psychological processes itself. So we adapted the a digit task from Wilsetal 2011, which also pointed out that, or gave evidence uh, that concurrent load during training is crucial uh, to change, to have any qualitative impact on participants' responses during the test phase. So in our experiments, we use the between subject design and uh, we ask participants to, uh, to reach an errorless block as a learning criterion. And this errorless block consisted of 18 consecutive correct responses. If, they participant, if participants reached this criterion, they were allowed to transition to the test phase. If uh, they didn't reach it by the, by the fifth block, uh, they were simply transitioned to the test phase anyways. Instead of symptoms, we, we used uh, abstract pictorial depictions of molecules. Uh, on the left side here on the figure, you see all the possible molecules that participants could see. Here, this is uh, this is not an actual abstract pictorial stimuli. The, these are all the possible molecules that we could present the participants. Um, we also we also use the doubled up design where participants uh, so two sets of symptoms and two sets of disease. Uh, but most importantly, we employed the concurrent load task during both the training and the test phase. And as importantly, we also imposed a resp response deadline in an attempt to control for this time difference uh, now, here you can see a bit of a more technical description of what happened in the experiment or what participants encountered. 
you see uh, in the left table that there are two sets of symptoms and two sets of diseases. You see that there are A, A B, A, C with common one and rare, rare one respectively and the second set of symptoms and diseases you see D, E and D, F with common one, well common two, sorry, and rare two. On the right side you see the critical test items or the items that we were interested in. Participants encountered other combination of symptoms as well, but we were mainly interested in the individual symptoms A, B, C and D, E, F and also the ambiguous combination of conflicting unique symptoms B, C and E, F. And now here you can see the actual trial structure. So the, I'm going to start with the concurrent load condition um, and then quickly outline what happened in the control condition. Here participants saw a fixation cross, then were transitioned to the digit load, where uh, we adapted the digit, uh, the concurrent load task from Wils et al. So participants uh, listened to a sequence of digits. These were like six spoken digits in a sequence, randomly uh, ordered, and they were asked to remember this sequence. Then we're moved on to the categorization uh, component, essentially the diagnosis task, where they saw combination of molecules and then asked to classify them into different viruses. Now, the, uh, then they made the response. They had five seconds to do it or timed out. In both cases, they were transitioned to the uh, to the feedback component, the categorization feedback component, where they uh, received feedback on their accuracy or given the correct response and were asked to respond faster in case of a timeout. Now, after that, they were moved on to the digit input component, where they were shown a random digit from a previous sequence. And uh, they were also asked to put in the digit that they heard to come after the one that they are currently shown. After they made a response or timeout, they similarly had five seconds to complete this component. Uh, they were told that their uh, their response was recorded, or they were told they were asked to respond faster in the in the following trials. They did not receive feedback on their accuracy in this uh, in this task. Then they had half a second of rest between trials. So there's a half a second inter trial interval. So in the control condition, uh, participants simply did not receive the digit load. So they didn't receive a sequence of spoken digits. And in the digit input component, they were asked to simply input the digit that they are shown on the screen. Everything else was uh, the same. Now, in order to cement uh, uh, this trial stu structure, I would like to walk you through the actual slides that participants uh, saw on the screen. Here, you see the fixation cross. Then you were transitioned to the uh, to the digit load component. Here, you heard a sequence of spoken digits like two, six, three, two, nine, five. Then you were moved on to the diagnosis task, the categorization task, and here you were at, you saw combination of those molecules and were asked to, to classify them into different viruses. You see that you could respond with the QRUP uh, buttons on the keyboard, uh, each corresponding to the different viruses. They Obviously, they were counterbalanced. Then you were moved on to, uh, to the feedback component where you receive feedback on, their, on your accuracy. Then you uh, needed to comp complete the digit, digit load task. Here you see the number six, which was followed by uh, a certain number. And you were asked to put in that number. Uh, then you were told that your response was recorded or whether you timed out and you needed to respond faster. And then you had a half a second inter-trial interval. This concludes uh, what we did in this experiment. So now we can look at the actual data. So 
here I would like to start with the training phase. This, uh, this figure on the right shows the blocks to criteria measure. So it shows how many blocks participants completed in each condition uh, before they were transitioned to the test phase. The top one with the, with the color yellow uh, shows corresponds to the control condition. The bottom one with the color blue corresponds to the concurrent load condition. And you see that in the control condition, participants needed uh, on average one less block to transition to the test phase. Now, um, here are our, our reaction times. So on the left side, you see the figure showing mean participants' reaction times. So each dot is a single participant. And you see that uh, the control condition on the left side and the concurrent load condition on the right side are quite comparable upon visual inspection. Unfortunately, with uh, the base factor is still inconclusive. Nonetheless, this response deadline is not a perfect solution, but at least we have no clear evidence that uh, the conditions differed. So after this, uh, we can finally look at the actual inverse base rate effect. So here you see the choice proportions in the table. You notice that there are three different uh, types of responses participants could make. The common, rare, and error. Now, error includes uh, timeouts or instances when participants classified, for example, uh, a symptom from the first set into diseases of the second set. Uh, and so in terms of the symptoms here, you can see that I only included the first set. It's because I collapsed two set of symptoms and diseases into one. So A is, is, bo is both shared symptoms from the two sets. And B is the common symptom from both sets. C is the common, uh, the rare symptom from both sets. And BC is the ambiguous combination of the unique symptoms from both sets. And now uh, let me just walk you through uh, each symptom individually. So you see uh, that the shared symptom kind of approximates the ba base rate. And in the control condition, there is a systematic common preference. Whereas in the concurrent load condition, this preference is still intact, but there is an increase in error rate. Uh, you see that in the control condition, the common symptom had fairly high accuracy. And in the concurrent load condition, this common symptom shows an increase in accuracy and a decrease in error rates. Now, this trend, uh, this trend is also observable on uh, the rare symptoms. So in, you can see here in the control condition, C has a high accuracy. And in the concurrent load condition, C has a small increase in accuracy, but a decrease in error rate. And on to uh, our uh, main, main stimuli of interest, we have BC showing the systematic rare preference, which is as indicated by the base factor here, is very reliable. So we can say that we observed the concurrent, the, inverse base rate effect in the control condition. And moving on to the concurrent load condition, you can see that there seems to be a rare preference here, but as indicated by the base factor, uh, we have clear evidence for the null, which means that uh, we have clear evidence that participants' responses were close to chance. Moving on to the main comparison, unfortunately, while we have clear evidence for the presence of an effect in the control condition and a clear evidence for the absence of the effect in the concurrent load condition, their direct comparison remains inconclusive. So now to sum up what we found here, we minimized the problem with reaction times as much as we could. And in an ideal scenario, we would have evidence for a null. Uh, 
we also have clear evidence for the inverse base rate effect in the control condition, and we have clear evidence for the absence of the effect in the concurrent load condition. We have no reliable evidence for any main interaction or main effect. Now, there can be a few reasons why it might be. For example, the study is fairly underpowered. We, in this experiment, we have a very small effect size, so we would need many hundreds of people per condition, which is just not feasible for a bit within a between subject design. But uh, if we assume that the load was actually had an effect and we take the results at face value, the choice proportions are still not consistent with the predictions of the model. Now, this means that there, uh, uh, there are a lot of areas that we need to explore again. For example, we have to revisit our main assumption that uh, uh, or the main assumption that previous work made in relation to attentional theories of learning and concurrent load. We can also, the model also can also postulate that the concurrent load had no effect. We have some, contrary, some evidence contrary to that, uh, as we can see that individual unique symptoms show higher levels of accuracy and show a decrease in error rate in the concurrent load condition compared to the control condition. And this is interesting because uh, there is some work that is consistent with what we are seeing here. Uh, in a different task, for example, in Wills uh, uh, et al. 2011, in the Shanks and Derby tasks, uh, people were much more likely to classify stimuli based on individual features. In our case, it would be individual symptoms under concurrent load. Um, so in our scenario, we can uh, we can hypothesize that the concurrent load actually facilitated uh, attention to be allocated to single uh, individual or single unique symptoms, so that you actually see which symptom is uh, uniquely predictive of the disease and you exploit that discovery by disregarding other um, other symptoms that are not useful in this scenario. For example, you can see an increase in error rate for the shared symptom, but a decrease error rate for the uh, a unique symptoms. Now, this is an ongoing research. So uh, based on what I outlined here, there are some uh, extra measures that we can take. For example, we can uh, we can return to the within subject design because uh, uh, given a small effect size, recruiting hundreds of people within conditions are not feasible. Uh, in a within subject design, we could actually look at people who reliably show the inverse base rate effect in a control condition and. In only include them in the main analysis. This would allow us to remove a lot of noise from the data and also include data, uh, also only include data that is relevant to the model's predictions, to testing the model's predictions. Uh, in addition, we can also uh, establish some sort of baseline performance for the concurrent load task. Uh, this is uh, something that we can't check here, participants had uh, 10 practice trials at the beginning of the experiment uh, where they could uh, try out the concurrent load, the digit task. But 10 practice trials is not a reliable measure whether they could actually do the task. So we think that it would be useful to have another phase in the experiment where participants only complete concurrent load trials. Uh, now that would also allow us to, uh, to create some sort of a base of comparison for further exploratory analysis. But yes, uh, this, this was my project. So I just want to thank my supervisor and wheels. Uh, the project would have not materialized without his inputs. And I would also like to thank Angus Singh, sir, who helped me with the hands-on everyday experimenting side of the project. And I would also like to thank you for your kind attention. So, thanks.